J.T. Crowley is talking books. On the show, you'll hear from emerging talent and seasoned veterans from around the world. Hello, I'm J.T. Crowley, and I'm delighted to have on my show today Melissa Schoenfield from New York State. She's joining me to talk about her book, Bitter or Better. The Melissa Schoenfield story by the inmate formerly known as 15G0717. She's written the book to give hope and a voice to women who have been incarcerated for carrying out an act that they felt they had no other choice but to carry out. But this is this book is her documented viewpoints of the circumstances that led up to her arrest, the trial, and it's also about her experiences in New York State penal system. She's the eldest of three siblings, the only girl. So work the other bit out, two, two brothers, everyone. She's the mother of two children, plus a grandmother. And her life up to the point of her arrest was many would see as idyllic. But that all changed when the arrest took place. She had a good job as a psychotherapist, a social worker, a loving family. But as said, that all changed. And life afterwards is very different. But she does have a life and she is enjoying what she does at the moment. She lives, everybody, in the middle of nowhere in New York State. Now, if you don't like snow... Well, that'd be the last place you'd go and live because they don't measure the snow in inches, they measure it in feet. And she doesn't like snow. So don't ask me why she lives in the middle of New York State, in the middle of nowhere. We won't go there. But she thoroughly enjoys the company of her daughter and grandson who live with her. So that's enough of introduction. Let's get um, Melissa onto the show to talk a bit about herself and her book and why she wrote it. Melissa, come and join me. Hi, John. Thank you so much for having me on. Oh, you're absolutely welcome. You know, when I first looked at your book and I reached out to you on LinkedIn, I thought I, I hope she's going to come on the show because when I looked at the book, it was amazing. And this is, you know, this for me, everybody, is going out on the edge here with the storyline. And I wanted to do that. And this is quite an edgy storyline, everybody. But I'm not going to tell the story. I'm going to get Melissa to tell the story. So before we open the book, Melissa, could you tell us who you are and why you wrote the book? Well, I was just an ordinary mom, grandmother, wife, sister. And then... um my daughter had to move back home uh, with her three-month-old baby, and it uh, was very stressful. The baby's father kept bullying, taunting, abusing. It just went on and on. And one day, uh, the mother of his other three children uh, was speaking with my daughter, and they realized he is going to bring a woman up from his country of origin, and they are going to take all four of the children. So not just my grandson, but the other three half-siblings of my grandson. My uh, then-husband came into the room and said, this has to end, and I took end to meet just that. Um, I wound up speaking to somebody who I thought could help me, and as it worked out, it was really a police detective who just pushed and pushed until I took all the bait. I uh, was arrested uh, on the site when I gave them uh, half the down payment, and I wound up spending uh, 1,385 1, days in New York State docks. I didn't start out writing a book. I was afraid I would forget the details because it was so stressful that your mind doesn't go on memory at all. So I started writing a daily journal. Some people would call it a diary, and I would send the pages home each day. I feared that if my room was inspected or tossed, uh, somebody would read it and take take what I wrote away. So I sent everything out. And it was suggested about two years in that I put this into a book format. And I went, why? Why would anybody want to read this? They said, well, you go in as this very privileged woman protecting her family, and you come out this softer, kinder, uh, 
all the real you, all the layers have been peeled away again. And when I realized in prison that the real prison where I was was just geography, that the real prison was the marriage I was in. And that allowed me to go forward. It was uh, very freeing to realize um, how I got to where I got. That desperation brings you to dark places. Sure. Now, Melissa, that is it's fascinating. And I think everybody can now start to see, you know, why the book has come into being. Now, Melissa, we agreed beforehand where we were going to focus in the book for the whole concept mm -hmm. of the interview, everybody, is not to give the game plan away, but it's to whet people's appetite sufficiently to make them want to explore who you are and what is this book about. And hopefully, go and buy it. Hint, everyone. So, can we go to the foreword? Because I thought this was fascinating, you know, and it really just kickstarted the book for me. So to start with, now, this is an article by Elizabeth Shepherd, And for me, yes. it captures you in 30 lines. It really does. So can you talk to us about this foreword? And do you think it was a good narrative as an opening gambit to your book? Did she do you justice? I think Elizabeth Shepherd was wonderful. She had come to the prison several times. I spoke with her hours on the telephone. And her complete role was not changing my words. It was giving me a direction because writing every day, that's like writing an encyclopedia. And I knew I couldn't publish anything like that. And I also knew while I was incarcerated or even on parole, retaliation would be very easy because they can find any reason to keep you or bring you in. So Elizabeth gave just enough about me that it, it was interesting even to me. And I, I appreciate everything she did. She was wonderful in how she handled that. And it was the essence of me. It is the essence of you. And that's why I wanted yes. to bring it in, because those 30 lines brilliantly capture you. Yeah. Um, now, following on from the preface, sorry, from the foreword, let's move on to the preface. <laughs> no, no, no. Just the facts. So this next section is the preface, just the facts. And what struck Correct. me at, as in a pivotal and heart-rending here, was you telling Jay, the hired hitman, the story. Yes. About the abuse your daughter found herself in at the hands of her partner. The meeting at the Walmart car park. Who helped you to get your daughter free? And who betrayed you, as it turned out that Jay was an undercover cop? Yes, correct. Would you care to fill us in, you know, to the little bit of the background here, you know? Sure. I did not seek Jay out on my own. Um, when my ex-husband asked me if I knew anybody who could take care of this, I went, I don't know anybody. Uh, he insisted I work with crazy people, which I don't and didn't. Uh, and the more I thought about it, there was somebody who I could phone for help. So I, I did. I phoned him. He told me I was on a phone. He couldn't speak to me. He hung up. I got a text message later that said, I'll be in touch with you shortly. He told me, give him some time. He had some ideas on how to help me. And the idea wasn't to kill anybody. It was to hurt him and scare him. that You don't touch women or children again, because my daughter and grandson were not the only uh, woman and child to have been hurt by him. Um, and I'm not just talking physical abuse. I'm talking the emotional abuse, um, everything that it entails, sexual abuse. It's all there. So I waited and waited. And I got a phone call about three weeks later from a guy named Jay. And I actually thought Jay was someone trying to make an appointment with me for my private practice. As it worked out, it wasn't. He wanted to meet, to meet him within 15 minutes. And I said, I'm not home. So it took uh, me almost two hours to get to him. And it never occurred to me that he, I didn't tell him my car. I didn't tell him anything about me, but he already knew what car I drove. Um, he made it that he was very uncomfortable where I was parked and I should move the car. 
what I didn't realize is I moved it right into the path of a of someone who was filming and doing audio as well. I asked Jay if he was a police officer. He told me no. And from what I understand, police officers do not have to tell you, in fact, if they are a police officer. So that was a pointless question. When I told him what was going on and what I needed, he looked at me and said, I don't leave witnesses. To me, that meant I am now a witness because I have told you the story and what I want. So I went along. Uh, at any time, the police could have come to my door, knocked on it and said, what is going on here? You're, you're, you're not this kind of person. You don't get involved with these things. But no one ever did that. Um, Jay, you could see he was visibly upset with what I was telling him when the uh, jawbone started making that little, you know, vein move. But he he made it clear that, you know, no witnesses. And if I was going down, so was he. So approximately uh, two weeks later, uh, my father had sent money to my ex-husband's office. Um, my husband at the time also went and got me a disposable phone. And that's how we handled it forward. Uh, I met him, I think, the following week, again, in Walmart parking lot. And um, he told me the address that I had given him was the wrong address, but that was the one he furnished to the courts. Uh, he showed me some pictures of where uh, he thought he frequented. I said, honestly, I wouldn't know. And then he told me how he wanted to go to Florida this week to take care of things. And I said, no, my, my husband has a conference that week. So it was all kind of put in motion. I made a very sarcastic comment that in hindsight was not that funny. But I asked him, what are you going to do with the body? And he said, well, I can show you on Snapchat. It's 10 seconds and it disappears. I went, I don't know if I want to see that. So then I said, you can always throw the body to the gators, meaning you're in Florida at the Everglades. Clearly, what I thought was amusing at the time in hindsight was not funny at all. Um, Actually, that's what kind of sealed the deal. After he left my car, I thought, I can't do this. And I I looked at the vehicle that he went into, and it was a green SUV. I slowed up, I stopped, and I thought, it's already rolling. I'm still a witness. So I left the Walmart parking lot. I did not run any lights or stop signs. When the police sirens went off, honestly, I didn't think they were for me. I got uh, encouraged to go into a hotel parking lot, and that's where three police officers came out. I was arrested and told, we believe we a crime was about to be committed. And that's where my legal started. Um, and I think I'm right in saying also, Melissa, that uh, your daughter's partner's father helped you as well. Yes, he did. He encouraged my daughter to leave Florida and go home to her family in New York. At the time, he also told her that his son was dead to him. Once my daughter was out of Florida for a while, he uh, reconciled with his son, and that ended the relationship with my daughter and his father. Um, it was a difficult move at best. I mean, that was her home, and everything had to be, you know, sent up north within a 12-hour a period of time. Everything was arranged. Her landlord even changed the locks on uh, on the condo. Um, two guys were great in getting her packed up in six hours and getting the van on the road. And the day after the American Thanksgiving, I picked my uh, then-husband up with my daughter, my grandson, and two dogs. And we've been together ever since. Absolutely. I believe the bail money was set at 250,000 um, US dollars or yeah. um, the bond um, was 500,000 US dollars. Yes. That's a lot of The money. same as OJ Simpson. Yeah. Same as OJ Simpson's. Yes. You say that. I, oh, yeah. yeah. I felt like a monster to mm. put that kind of money on my head when I didn't think I was dangerous. Nobody would help me. And I believed in taking care of my family. I didn't realize at what cost I would go to, yeah. but nobody would help. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Let's go to chapter one, the dream. Ah. This is you returning home. But is it your home? Things are very different. Marlon, your dog, your ex-husband being cuffed by the police. 
My question to you here, Melissa, is, is this reality or is this, as the chapter heading says, was it a dream? A dream in your head? Okay, I think like it was a it. little of both. Yeah, I a think it was both? a little bit of both. What's yeah. that? Yeah. Um, three days after I uh, went into the prison system, because jail is different than prison, and my ex-husband sold my car, which at the time was a Mini Cooper, and I loved my car. Um, hey, I like so that. So the dream that starts British out. Cars. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. It was wonderful. You know, six six on the floor. Um, and I drove it home, and it wasn't the same car I had, but it was still a Mini Cooper. And to drive it down my my road, to see the lake again, to see my home, and from the outside, things look great. And my next door neighbor had put a, a green ribbon around her tree waiting for me to come home. And it was still there. And as a matter of fact, in reality, it still is on the tree. And it's been, uh, what, almost 10 years. And um, I had to figure out how to get into the house. And fortunately, everything was the same as, you know, when I had lived there. And I uh, went in the house. And as much as it was the same house, it wasn't at all. I was erased. I was invisible. Everything was painted over. Everything that we had traveled and any souvenirs we had were taken off the walls. Uh, the shelves were gone. There was no personality left in the house. And that was baffling to me in the dream. Uh, knowing that count time in prison, there's many different times during the day, but the afternoon one is at 4 p.m. You feel it in your body. And I felt it. And I have the dog in my lap and the dog gets very tense because he hears the garage door open, which is something he would have done in reality anyway. And I hear my ex-husband put the key in the door, come through. He leaves his uh, wallet and keys up in the kitchen desk. And as he walks down the hallway, he sees me sitting there. And I think he was actually frightened. And he said, what are you doing here? Uh, I'm calling the police. Did you escape? And it's like, no, I have that covered. And then I yell, oh, boys, and the feds come out and arrest him with uh, zip ties behind his back, which is very painful. And uh, he said to me, how can you do this? I'm the father of your children. And I kind of look at him. Exactly. Exactly. I was the mother of your children. And you look what you did to me. Mm. So it was. Uh, it was a little rough, but the reality of it was. That was his behavior from the time I was arrested forward of this slowly erasing me. And and I felt invisible as well. So I think the dream is a the crash between reality and maybe what I hoped would happen. But I really didn't want it to happen. I didn't want him arrested. I took the whole blame. Hmm. You did. I did. Now. We had to include this chapter, didn't we, Melissa? Mama Bear. Ah. Uh, <laughs> Mama Bear. We both agreed on yes. this one, everyone. Mama Bear, chapter three. For yes. me, this chapter highlights. Now, I'm just going to spell this out. P-O-S-S-D. Now, whether you tell people what it means, that's entirely up to you. Um, the name you chose to give your daughter's ex-partner now, I know what it stands for. What but... happened? There you go. You froze there. Okay. We'll start that one again. Okay. Now, we both agreed, didn't we, Melissa, that this chapter, Mama Bear, chapter three, is going in this interview. Um, for me, this chapter highlights, I'm going to spell this, everybody, P-O-S-S-D. Uh, the name you chose to give your daughter's ex-partner. Now, I know what it stands for, but this chapter really does lay bare just how vulnerable POSDS's victims were. I'll let you explain the POSSD and what's going on. We were sitting at our dining room table eating dinner and my grandson was in his high chair. And I've always believed no matter how old a child is, they still hear, they learn, they know. 
So I didn't want to call his father any one of a number of other derogatory terms. And I'm sitting there thinking, and I refer to him as posse. And of course, my family looks at me and asks me what it is. And I, um, I told them it stood for piece of shit sperm donor. And that kind of summed it up. My grandson wasn't any the wiser. And that's how I referred to him there on in. Mama Bear comes from an interesting place. Um, a lot of people don't give as much credit as they should to their own traumas and their own childhood, you know, trials and tribulations. I had a mother who was an artist and art was first. My adopted brother was second. My father and younger brother and I tied for third place. So I had to kind of fend a lot of things on my own. And I became very protective of my brothers and of my father. Um, my mother and I were always at odds. So when I had children, I was extremely protective of them to the point where I remember taking my daughter out of my mother's arms that you're not going to raise your voice while you're holding her. She was highly offended. I went, it's my baby. So that mama bear thing came from doing the opposite of what my mother did. And unfortunately, no matter how old my children got, I still played mama bear being a protector. When my grandson was born, my daughter had to have a C-section and she's in bed, not being able to move. And she goes, you got to change the baby. And it's like, okay. So he was in his little bassinet and he looked at me with those big navy blue eyes. And my thought that went through was, I will always protect you. And I guess I took it to an extreme because there's a difference between protection and actually breaking the law. Hmm. And really that's is. really where Mama Bear comes from. Yeah. 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 And that's why we're talking about it, everyone. Now, chapter right. five, Crime and Punishment. Yes. This is the chapter mm. that uh, you disclose the charges, waiver of right to appeal, the sentencing transcripts, and what your sentence was. And I thought when you were writing this, this must have been a particularly difficult chapter for you to write because you must have been recalling yeah. all the courtroom scenes, you know, and standing there and listening to the judge, listening to the um, prosecution, to the defence counsel and all that. And I just thought this must have been a very difficult uh, chapter for you to write. So why have you put all this documentation in here you know the transcript you know what you said what the judge says what the lawyer said all this is in here was this important for you to put in it was then i don't know that it would be now but then i think i was trying to prove maybe to myself not just other people that here's what really happened don't change the facts don't change the story here is what really happened. And the court documents are verbatim, but you can uh, see how originally I was charged with first degree attempted murder, first degree solicitation, first degree conspiracy. And my lawyer got everything knocked down to second degree murder, which only, right? And uh, obviously the sentence wouldn't be as severe, even though the um, assistant DA tried to make it quite severe. He wanted 15 to 25, which is... I would have come out in a body bag. Mm. So my lawyer got it to five. Well, actually, my lawyer didn't. The judge overrode the DA and said five flat. You don't want to drop the charge to any lower. I say five flat. What five flat means is I I don't go in front of a parole board. Um, it doesn't get extended that with the uh, merit and uh, good time. I get out even earlier. But the judge is the one who took it over. Uh, so he didn't he didn't let the DA do anything else. But I think if you're going to read the book, everybody, look at this chapter in particular, because it's this transcript of the courtroom. What's happened, what's said, um, what um, Melissa was charged with. It's a very, very interesting um, chapter, but it's it's a fact. It's a fact chapter. Uh, and, not and that's a why I put it in there. Yeah. Right, that's exactly why I put it in there, that it's not just me telling a story, that here's the facts that go here's along the with facts. it. Here's right. the facts, yeah. Here's the slide. Right. Yeah. Now, Melissa, part two of the book, you're primarily talking about your experiences in the prison system. 
You devote three chapters to this section. They be in reception at Bedford Hills, limbo or reality at Bedford Hills, and life at Taconic Correctional Facility in Bedford Hills, New York. Now, chapter six and seven are very, very short, everyone, but chapter eight isn't. And there's more in this chapter. So we're not going to go to chapter six and seven. We're going to concentrate on chapter eight, everybody. Um, and this is you talking about the prison regime, uh, what you experienced. So I'm just going to sit back here and let you tell us. OK, um, well, to begin with, when you go from jail to prison, you are even um, restricted more so. You are leg shackled, you are waist shackled, and obviously you're, you're handcuffed. But there's also this black box that they put between your two handcuffs so that you cannot move your wrists. So someone who was older, like me, with arthritis, it was extremely painful. And I believe even without arthritis, you would be in a lot of pain because your hands have to stay parallel. So on the bus from uh, Western New York down to uh, Bedford Hills, it was almost a 10 hour ride because of the stops. Um, I was leg shackled to another woman who drank all her juice before we even left the uh, compound. And I told her, we're only getting up to go out of the bathroom once and you're taking care of your own pants. I'm not helping you. And then she did. She only went once, but extremely uncomfortable, very difficult to eat. We got into Bedford Hills late at night and in the uh, the trap, which is the two gates while you wait in between and they, they go through your name and you know who you are. Uh, we didn't have DIN numbers assigned yet, our designated inmate number. But she, that uh, correctional officer starts screaming at you. And you got to wonder, why are you screaming at me? What is with all the screaming? And I don't do well with loud noise on the best day. So uh, this is called reception. And you get off the bus. They uh, take off, you know, all the chains and shackles. And then you sit and wait. And you uh, wind up being assigned to a bed in a, a rather large room with little partitions, so you really don't have privacy, but but it gives you a little bit of something. Uh, it was September, we had a heat wave. The windows were like little, um, you know, the gel windows that you crank open, so you don't have much airflow. The fan was considered a privilege. The inside of those buildings go into excess of 100 degrees or more, so it's very difficult to stay there. Uh, there were some women who had seizures, some women passing out. And the beauty of it is if you did that, you went to the infirmary and the infirmary was air conditioned. So you're kind of motivated not to feel well. Uh, while other women were leaving this area to go to their assigned um, unit, I was one of the lucky ones and got to wait almost three weeks till somebody decided, let's move her. And they moved me into a dorm with 76 women. And fortunately, I had the bottom bunk because of all my medical. And I went through a couple of upper bunk mates as they got reassigned to other, other uh, prisons. I um, was on medication that took care of some of the arthritic pain and um, also restless leg. And anybody who has that knows it's impossible without meds. Well, the prison decided they weren't going to give me my meds, even though the judge assured us that my medical records would go with me to Bedford Hills. Whether they came or not, I don't know, but I didn't get the meds. So my husband at the time uh, called the superintendent of the prison, not a good idea, and the uh, acting commissioner of DOCS, which is the Department of Corrections and, and Community Supervision, and said basically that if I didn't have my meds by, I guess it was later that afternoon, he'd be going to the media and he'd be coming in with somebody higher up to find out what's going on. I got my meds that day. The problem is that night, the dorm was also trashed under the premise of looking for for drugs. They weren't looking for drugs. I was the last uh, area that was scrutinized, so to say. Uh, my mattress was flipped around so much that it was torn along with my pillows. I wasn't using sugar, and yet sugar was thrown all over my photos. And when you're in prison, photos are sacred because that's one of the things to your outside world. Um, I had a drinking cup that got smashed. And when I tried to address this, I was told in a very nasty way to shut up. So I went to the sergeant who told me, shut your mouth or I'll put you in shoe. Shoe is an acronym for the special housing unit, which some people think of as solitary confinement. 
all because I asked a question. So one of the other inmates literally pulled me out of that room before I lost it because I still had that that sense of, um, I don't want to say entitlement, but that's almost what it was, that this is not how you treat people. But you have to realize DOCS's uh, mission statement is custody, care, and control. You're in their custody, they don't care, and you have no control. And the sooner you realize that, the easier jailing will be. Uh, due to what my husband tried to do, uh, about nine days later, I was bringing my food back to the dorm, and I went on the kosher diet just so I could have some decent food. Being on that diet, you didn't have to stay in the mess hall. You could bring your food back to your, your dorm, which is what I did. And I thought my bunkie was coming back in, but instead it was somebody else wearing a green uniform. I had my head slammed into the upper bunk, which was, this whole thing was metal at the time. I don't know if they're still metal now. Uh, slammed into the ladder going up to the bunk and back into the metal top frame. I wound up losing three teeth, my nose collapsed, and I had quite a contusion on my forehead. Now, if you do not report an injury, including even a simple black and blue to medical, again, you can get ticketed or go to shoe because were you fighting? What happened? So I had to report it. And I knew that if I told the whole truth what happened, there's retaliation and retaliation's horrible. I mean, it's very subtle what they do, but it's it's severe. So all I said was I hit my head on the bed. It wasn't a lie, but it just wasn't the whole story. Several days later, I was transferred to uh, to Connick, which literally is across the street from Bedford. Bedford is the maximum security for women uh, prison. Taconic is the minimum medium. There's only three women's prisons in the state of New York. I popped a sick call slip for the dentist, and she saw me the next day. When she learned that my husband was a dentist, she did everything she could to help me make sure I had teeth. But the problem is uh, prison does not do anything to fix teeth. You either, I think you get them cleaned like every two or three years, and if you have a cavity, it's filled or they pull the tooth. That was not an option. I wasn't losing any more teeth. So this dentist was very good to me. She would try to build it up with amalgam and what have you. So I didn't look like a, a jack-o'-lantern. Um, what I learned very quickly is there's no logic or reason what happens in prison. The rules change daily. Even though there's directives, at the bottom of every directive, it says, at the discretion of the officer. So rules get changed all the time. You don't know what the rules are to be told, oh, yeah, they changed today. Uh, I was about two and a half weeks before I was moved to a private room in a housing unit. And ironically, I got to stay in that housing unit for my entire bid. Usually you're, you're moved every year to a different room, but it's usually to a different uh, floor. And I was permitted to stay there, which said something, I guess, about my my personality. I don't know. And they also made sure I always had Southern exposure so I could continue to draw with the best light possible. And for that, I was always grateful. Um, prison is mundane. Uh, there's a saying that says, uh, do your time, don't let your time do you. And if you're just going to sleep, which most people do in the beginning of their, their bid, uh, I think it's a healing process. As you get out of that, you need to have some purpose in a day. So I kept applying to be an inmate program assistant, which would also give me six months off of my sentence to get out. Uh, it was a choice of that or doing 24 college credits, but because I had a master's degree, they wouldn't let me go back to school. So I worked as a, a teaching assistant. I worked mornings, three hours for what should have been two years, but with all my medical, it was a lot less. Um, that provided me structure in the morning. And then afternoons, I would knit. I would help other people with their knitting. I would help inmates sew, you know, when they'd lose a button or a hem would get ripped out, which, by the way, you're not supposed to do because it's considered destroying state property. But they're not going to give you new clothes, so there's an option. Um, I would help some of the Spanish people with their English so that they could pass a GED. And then you spend time cooking because you're cooking literally in a stripped out cell that has uh, two burners before cooking eyes. You've got to borrow pans unless someone handed pans down to you. You can't buy them anymore. You can't have them sent in. And uh, you get yourself attached to another group so that you all put your food in together and you're able to make at least one decent meal a day because mess hall food is not only healthy, it's horrible. It's uh, low-grade soy. And a lot of the women winds up with 
hormonal cancers like uh, ovarian, um, cervical, breast cancer. And you can't help but think it's got to be what we're eating. Um, if you need um, something health-wise, you have to drop a sick call slip unless it's an emergency. Dropping a sick call slip can take anywhere up to two weeks to be seen. So people think that while you're incarcerated, you know, Camp Cupcake, I'm going to tell you it's anything but that. There are COs that are very good and very kind, as long as you are polite and appropriate. And some of them I would talk to about very personal things. And there are others that are so mean and so controlling that they want to see you fail. They want to break you. And I made a promise to myself that I wasn't going to come out broken. And that's where the journal also came from. I could write what I was afraid about. I could, I could write what was going on in prison. And then I up the ante and I started writing my grandson's stories. And with that, it was always about something going on in prison, but I made the characters into animals that unless you were intuitive enough to know what was going on, you had no idea what I was really writing about. And that's what saved me. Mm. So it was, uh, it was quite an experience, unlike anything I have ever had. Mm. I'm just going to let that chapter rest everybody because there's nothing to add. Melissa said it all. Now, part three, the light at the end of the tunnel. And now there's a fair proportion of this chapter is, for me, it's like a private diary record of counting down the last 55 days before you have been released. I liked the farewell letter you included, you know, and a reference to one day you will, um, Lady Antebellum. And right towards the end, there's a mission statement. So I'm asking you is, why did you set this chapter up in this way? Um, And all your feelings, frustrations, expectations, fears really come to the fore here. Am I right? Yes, absolutely. I think you become, well, you become institutionalized, whether you want to or not. There's varying, you know, levels of institutionalization. And I think I was so used to this mundane routine. In some ways, I wanted to believe I could get my life back. And in other ways, I knew it would never be the same. So you, you start to play, this is your life. And you can't help but reflect The crime itself almost becomes surreal. It's like a really bad movie. And I also felt it was important to tell the stories of the other women in my housing unit who had no voice. And people don't give them credit. I think once you're in prison, people assume you're always going to be that ex-felon, or I'm sorry, they call it offenders now. So much nicer. And I, um, I felt it was important for them to have a voice. A lot of them were illiterate, which I had a difficult time comprehending in the United States to have this kind of illiteracy. But this is also why so many people wind up in prison, because there are no other options. Um, For a lot of the women, you know, crimes because of men, and the men aren't incarcerated because they were abusive to the women. But if the women strike back, they're the ones for some reason who get caught and who wind up in the legal system. So that was a part of it. I also didn't believe I'd ever really get out of prison. I thought I'd be going out in a body bag. I would always look out my window, which was right over the lobby area, so I could see visitors coming in and I could see personnel coming in and out. And I'd be so happy when the women would leave in the morning in whatever clothes that you know somebody sent in for them because you don't leave in prison clothes. And then I turn around and cry because I never saw myself leaving. I was sure I was going to die in prison. So when my day came to leave and they called my name, you know, Seanville, let's go. And it's like, oh, okay. As I went downstairs, I was still waiting for somebody to, you know, pull my collar. No, we made a mistake. Get back upstairs. I didn't believe it was really going to happen. And even when I left, I was still waiting for like a police car to come and say, you weren't supposed to be released today. And It was just, I think we punish ourselves more than any system can. And too many people allow the system to do that without trying to change it. 
And it's a very draconian system to even think of trying to change, to infiltrate that. And a lot is going on now to make change. But I just never believed I'd be part of that. So that's what was difficult for me. Um, it's exciting. You know, people come to your door saying, hey, I really like your pink fluffy bathrobe. Can I have it when you leave? And it's like, I'm still wearing it. I really like your sheets. Can I have your sheets when you go? And so you, you're you really giving things away, almost like, you know, you're planning your own death. You know, how you give things away when people are suicidal. And everything was gone. So instead of looking like a, a person who was jailing well, because I did have all... I had everything more than I needed, thanks to family and friends. But everything was cleared out of my my room. It wasn't really a cell. It was a room. Um, we had regular doors. And um, I had none of those creature comforts anymore. And going home, I was afraid to take any of those creature comforts. Uh, living in that situation, you live with so little and realize you don't need much to be to be okay. So I felt very guilty when I came out going through my things and realizing all the stuff I had that just was not necessary. And don't get me wrong, I like my stuff, but you forget a lot about it while you're you're in there, even though you fantasize about it. You realize it's not important. And I think that was a theme that most women felt. No, we'd think about it, but we never really believed we'd get it back. And I was also coming out divorced, no home to live. My daughter uh, had me move in with her. My grandson gave me his playroom to live in. And I felt guilty about that, that I'm taking this away from a six-year-old. And here it is. I was, what, 62 when I got out. And I'm thinking, this is not at all how I thought my life would be. And then you're on parole. Parole was supposed to be five years. It wasn't. I got off after uh, under three. And um, parole is double jeopardy because they almost wait for you to make a mistake to haul you back in. And they can find anything they want. So I just didn't leave the house very often. And this way, nothing could happen. Um, like I said, it changes who you are and, and you never get all of yourself back. Mm. As far as I've come, there are some things I know that aren't going to come back. I don't know if it's fear or that kind of rigid structure. But every so often, my daughter and I will s speak specifically about this. And there's just some things that's not going to change. I went from being very social to being very happy being by myself. And I don't mind my own company. And I think it's from all the time I did spend alone. And it made me feel safe. And I do feel safe alone. I don't have to look after anybody else but me. Hmm. Yeah. So that chapter was important because there were a lot of epiphanies in there. What ifs and what once was. And of course, it's, you know, it's, done like a diary everybody you know the dates there you know the time almost yeah. um you know the good bits and then the setbacks um so yeah in part three it is the only chapter in part three uh, but it's a big chapter and it's full of very very interesting um story of melissa's her life um you know in the last 55 days while she was in the new york state penal system yeah. now Melissa, now you've written this book, you're going to write another one. I am. Um, I've been saying I was going to do this since I got out. <laughs> so first what I said is I don't have a desk. And we had a flood in our basement a year ago, and it took the insurance company eight months to, to give us money. So the house, everything from the basement is either on the first floor or in my room. Oh, I don't have room for a desk. Well, guess what? I got a desk. I said, well, I can't write. I, I I don't have, you know, where's my laptop? I got a laptop. Well, I don't have a chair. You need a chair to write. My daughter bought me a chair. So I have no excuse. So as soon as this basement is finished, which is supposed to be actually tomorrow afternoon, I plan on spending two hours in front of my computer. Even if I could just write the word the, it's a start. It's a word on a page. I did start writing several weeks ago, though, and I was talking about... um post-incarceration syndrome and how real it is. And a lot of people think it's an excuse, but it isn't. Um, it's the way it changes you, changes relationships, friendships, uh, jobs, motivation, mental health, it changes all of that. And that wasn't my intention to start writing that, but that's what just kind of came out. 
What I really want to write now is the whole story of what happened in prison because there's no retaliation anymore. I've been off of parole uh, over two years and they, they can't touch me. So in telling the whole story, I think people need to know the process of being institutionalized and how you lose the pieces of you. And I think anybody who's been through a, um, a traumatic divorce understands how you lose pieces of yourself and you lose that motivation. And prison actually divorces you from everything and everyone, even though they visit often. And, and you, I mean, I had mail every day. It's not the same. You still give up pieces of yourself. And to get that back, it's like your personality is altered. And I always refer to it as um, Arnold Schwarzenegger in uh, The Eraser, oh, you yeah. know, where he they just stripped his personality and he just became someone else. And while the core of me is still there, there's a lot of other quirks I know I've developed. And uh, some of them are rigid. I'm frequently reminded by the people I live with. And other things I just don't care about anymore because I just realized they weren't important. When everyone was complaining about COVID's quarantine, I couldn't understand what they were complaining about. You can go anywhere you want in your house or outside. I was living in a, what, a nine by six, an eight, eight by six for almost four years. This was no big deal. And of course, you can't explain that to people in the same way, but you know, that's what it came down to. COVID was not hard for me to handle until I got COVID, but yeah. Mm. So it's... um. You can fight the system and you will lose. You'll also waste a lot of energy and it's exhausting. Or you find out how to work within the system. And they say people who jail well learn how to adapt. And that's I did not jail well. I learned how to jail better. Um, you know, something as silly as this mattress sucks. So someone told me, why don't you take your books? Because I had a lot of books. You put them under your mattress and it gives you a little bit of a cushion and support. Why didn't I think of that? My pillow was like sleeping just on a pillowcase. They went, put your clean laundry in your pillow. You now have a nice fluffy pillow. And it was silly things like that that I never, it never occurred to me. Because before you need a new pillow, you get a new pillow. I didn't mm -hmm. have to stuff it with anything. And it's, you become MacGyver. If you, you gel well at all, you become MacGyver and learn, you know, there are different things you can all use for the same purpose. And even something as simple as a nail cutter, there's your scissors. Uh, you use it for yarn. Uh, you use it for so many other things, for sewing, because you're not allowed to have scissors. And again, it's that you adapt to what's around you. And if you don't, you you don't make it out of prison or you wind up back in prison because you didn't you didn't adapt to something that was going on there. And that struggle is very real. Mm. I'm intrigued, uh, Melissa. Who do you see as reading your book? But more importantly, who do you want to see reading your book? I'd like to see people who are truly naive about the prison system. Um, like I said, there's, and I was no better before I went in. There's a notion that you have great health care. You can go to college for free. Uh, you have cable TV, which I'm going to say, yes, we did have cable TV, but it wasn't given to us. It was through the uh, program, the inmate program group that actually provided the Internet, uh, not Internet, the uh, cable. Um, I want people to see that education, although algebra hasn't changed in how you do it. The books can certainly be updated. The uh, budget is so small that there are no new books. Uh, my job as a teacher's aide, a lot of the time was to erase marks in the books so that someone else can use it and not see all the other, other information that was put there. Uh, using a little piece that's not written on in the paper. You know, you rip that out and there's scrap paper, even a piece of paper you take a test on because there is no budget for that. Uh, seeing that um, if you don't have someone on the outside sending things in, it's not you deserve it. You know, this thing, well, don't do the crime if you don't want to pay the time. I hate that saying. I didn't go out to commit a crime. Most people don't. So you get caught up in circumstances and you can't see literally the forest for the trees. And you do things that you, you never thought you were capable of, but it does happen. And the punishment shouldn't be taking away your soul. It should be giving you something back. 
how can these grown women not know how to sew a button on a shirt or to fix a hem or for that matter to make pancakes, which seems to be a stable in prison? How can you not know this? And that was things I took for granted. Prison, the prison in the United States is so archaic that it, it's not, it doesn't make people better. Typically it makes them bitter. And something like, I believe it's Finland, where they give you a furnished apartment and it's a healing time for you. And you learn how to take care of yourself and make your body strong again. That's what prison should be about. It, it should not that it should be easy. The lesson should be, you can't operate like this. You need to be better. And unfortunately, that's not what we do here. We strip you of everything. And, and most often, you're not. Recidivism in uh, the United States is very high. And it's really sad. It shouldn't be. Yeah. So would you say your book is for everybody? I think it could be. Um, the only person it's not for right now is my grandson. I promised him when he was uh, 18, I'd save him a copy and I'd autograph it for him. But there's no reason for him to read about it now. No. Yeah. He knows what happened, but he doesn't need all the details. No, he doesn't. No. Where can people get your books from? Well, actually, I'm being republished. I think the new books come out next week, and that's with UL Media. Uh, Dorrance had the first uh, publication of it. Amazon, you can pick it up, Kindle. And actually, if you go to any bookstore and ask for it, it can easily be ordered. Well, there you go, everybody. That's um, Melissa Schoenfield's story. It's fascinating. And three and a half years of her life is all wrapped up in this book. What she went in for, how she processed the uh, situation there and just given a little hint as to how her life has been afterwards. As she says, it's not a bed of roses, but when you read the book, keep it in mind. That's all I say. Melissa, Melissa, thank you very much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. Oh, thank you. I'm JT Crowley. Wherever you're listening in the world, stay safe. Until next time. <laughs>